Welcome, everybody. I'm Tony Parisi. I'm here to talk about GLAM, a new declarative language for 3D web content. A little bit about me. I am uh, currently in San Francisco running a WebGL development agency, building applications for uh, e-commerce, 3D printing, starting to get into virtual reality a little bit as well. Uh, I've written a couple of books for O'Reilly and Associates. If you guys hang out uh, at the end, I'll go grab a box of books I brought, but I don't have them right here. And uh, you can get a free copy of my newest book if you're interested. And uh, that stuff will all be online so you know how to find me, talk to me. I also run the WebGL developers meetups in San Francisco. So if you're interested in WebGL in the Bay Area, come to those. There's always something good happens about once a month. So here's the situation. We have this great platform for rendering 3D rich media today. It's called a web browser. It does a great job of mind-blowing effects, all kinds of presentations, applications that you can build that were not possible a couple years ago. The way you do that is by using an API, and you program. And that's wonderful. It gives you ultimate control, very low-level access to everything you need, all the way down to the pixels and shader if you need to. Uh, but in my opinion, the pendulum has swung a little bit far. In order to do anything simple, you've got to screw around a lot. You're either mucking about at low-level API levels with WebGL, or you are trying to find which open source toolkit to use to render your 3D, what kind of tools pipeline to create it. And if you want to do simple stuff, it's kind of daunting. It's kind of too much to do. And I think at this point in time, we need a simple way to create 3D content in pages that anybody can do using markup and style it with CSS. And that's what we're talking about today. So first, let's do a really simple contrived example to illustrate what I'm talking about. Let's say we want to make a cube rendered in our web page with a bitmap image on it, what we call in the 3D business a texture map. There's some ways to do that right now using today's web browser technologies. The first way would be to use the WebGL API built into all of our browsers. The way you do that is displayed up on this screen. That's the code to draw a cube. That is about 20% of the code to draw a texture mapped cube in WebGL. If you want to do this, it would take about 300 lines of code. OK? So not groovy. So what most of us do, especially us mere mortals who don't like to mess about in low-level rendering APIs all day long, is we find an open source library. The most popular one is called 3.js. Now with 3.js, it gets quite a bit easier. Instead of 300 lines of code, you've got this about 20 lines of JavaScript, the surrounding markup, another 40 to get things on the page with the canvas element. And it looks pretty simple, right? You create a renderer object, you create a scene, you throw a camera in so you can see the things in the scene. You put a light on it so you can actually see the surfaces. You get a texture map via URL. That's just regular old you know, image, data, image data in a web browser. And then you create a cube geometry, add it to the scene. Well, that's all great. And you get a cube that looks just like that screenshot I showed you. Guess what, though? That thing doesn't spin. It's not animated. If you drag the mouse, you want to do anything with it, click on it. 40, 50, 100 more lines of code before you're done. So, kind of a weird situation. I mean, for something as simple as putting a cube on a web page, why can't I just make a tag that says cube? Well, now you can. So I'm working on this R&D project. That's all it is. It's up on GitHub right now. Uh, no big forces behind it yet, though interestingly, I'm getting approached by people to actually work on projects to do just this. And it's called GLAM for GL and Markup. And what GLAM does is it gives you a declarative way to make 3D content in your web page. You can create shapes with it, the kind of simple shapes I'm showing you here, like a cube. You can also do complex meshes. Not the best way to do it in markup. We're going to talk about a way you don't have to do that. Um, you can animate your content using CSS animations, by the way. Nothing special there. You can put cameras, lights, full scenes with hierarchy, so objects contain other objects. You can animate them. They animate together. And because markup is a really crappy way to create 3D rich content, it also lets you import models in other formats, such as Collada, GLTF, which is a new uh, binary and JSON combination format for doing rich 3D scenes. 
Um, GL also, uh, Glam also comes with a CSS set of extensions, and it's custom parsing because if you know your CSS, if you've got properties in your CSS that the browser doesn't know about, it happily reads them, but you can't actually get at them from your code. So the only way to do what I'm about to show you today is I grabbed a jQuery extension and uh, that's a parser, you know, jQuery plugin that parses CSS. Um, and then, here's the best part of it, in my opinion, not just authoring with the tags, but you've got a DOM-like API to actually access it. It's literally the DOM API in the examples I'm going to show you. Now, the DOM is, is getting maligned a little bit at this conference. There's some people who don't like the DOM anymore. I mean, we all know it has problems. It has efficiency issues. Um, there's all kinds of issues with it. So some people are coming along and saying, DOM bad. Uh, use my toolkit to render your great content. I'm not in that camp. I am in the camp of we are web developers. I come to these conferences. I've been speaking at these conferences for two years already for uh, Anne and the group here. And what I see flashed up on the screen more than anything is markup and DOM code. Yeah, 20% of the stuff I see is JSON and some other fancy stuff for all you hardcore engineers. But the majority of content I see flashed on the screen is built with DOM even, and CSS, even with its SAS tools and everything else. But it's built that way, jQuery to program it. That's not going to change. Nobody is going to make the DOM go away, no matter how good their rendering APIs are. It's what we have to live with. It is the platform that we're building the future 3D web on. We're going to build that for Oculus Rift eventually, too, and all those other VR devices when they come out. And that's the way it's going to work. And so this is a bit of a manifesto, folks, I, um, which is why these slides are really wordy. You know, I didn't do the jobs thing where it's like, picture, word. This one's a takeaway. Like, spread this around. It's up on SlideShare. It'll be up on the site for everyone. I want the meme to spread. So I wanted all the words to be in there so you would see them. Uh, another thing that Glam is all about is look, look at 2D graphics today in your web browser. If you're not doing Canvas stuff, but, you know, look at the page elements you have. The browser knows how to scroll those pages for you. Yeah, you can get in there and fiddle with the mouse and do your own scrolling. You can turn things off. But you didn't have to write mouse tracking code to scroll the page. Why should you have to write mouse tracking code to say, rotate a model around on the screen? Or to do a walkthrough if it happens to be an environment instead? Why not have some built-in behaviors for doing that? So Glam has some of that stuff too. But if you need to get under the covers, you write more JavaScript, you write your own elements, and you can even write your own shaders. I'm going to show you some example of Glam with shaders. So it's all rendered with WebGL, and eventually will be built with web components and polyfills and polymer and all that. Don't have that working yet because I started this project before uh, polymer and web components were getting traction. So I'm going to go back and do a port of this at some point soon. So this is all sort of, I did all the mucking and coding and the kind of stuff you have to do in the DOM in order to build something like polymer or like web components, but ultimately it should just get into an architecture like that. Yes, Alan? And, and feel free to interrupt like Alan's doing right now. It's really, it's okay. Uh, this would admit of alternate implementations as well, correct? Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, you don't have to use my code. I mean, don't have to use web components, for example. Oh, or, or web components or anything. I mean, it's just a tag set. It's just a spec for a tag set. Excellent. And APIs to go with it. So now, here's what your cube looks like, right? You got your, basically your document type says glam. You got a scene that says this is all the objects that are going to be in the scene. And then you say cube. You don't have to give it an ID. I gave it an ID because what else am I going to do? I'm going to style it with CSS. And so I threw a few properties in there. So basically the cube would tilt toward you and rotate about its Y axis. That's what RX and RY before I'm trying to go DOM like on these. It's very similar to SVG's got similar properties like this. Um, and image, I, you know, I, I could have used background dash image. That's a CSS standard property, right? But it's not really the background image. It's, it's the texture map that goes on top. I could have called this texture. Uh, in any case, none of these properties are recognized by a browser today. Again, that's why I needed the custom parser. But that's how you do it. And that's how you should do it for something like this. And now we can get into all the different examples. Wait, before we get into this, let me actually show you that in practice. So. So there it is in 3JS, that was that 40 lines. Again, I'm now dragging the mouse. I can't rotate it or anything. To animate it, I have to write 40 or 50 more lines of code. If I want to roll over it, change the color, get an event back, another 40 or 50 lines of code at least. Ah, nonsense in my opinion. Right. Here's that cube again. Not animated yet, but it's got a built-in viewer. Easy peasy if you got the right technology underneath and I've got a stack I'll walk you through at the end of the talk. Now, um, I didn't get into my full background. I was telling people I'm a WebGL developer now, kind of a bit of a world expert on application level development in WebGL. But 
I have a very long background in doing this kind of uh, tag set design for 3D. Back in uh, 20 years ago and three months ago, uh, I created a language with a few other people. Uh, I created a language called VRML. Now, some of you aren't in the room aren't old enough to even know what that is. Maybe or maybe you used it in middle school, right? Um, and that was uh, a handlebar mustache version of doing 3D markup. This was pre uh, XML, and that was very crude. It just did little blocks and you know sort of toy graphics in 1994 when computer processing was measured in megahertz. That's with an M. Uh, there were dial-up modems, right? And there was no hardware acceleration. All the rendering was in software. So needless to say, we were a bit early. We kind of worked on a couple of versions of that, added animation, uh, skin characters, all this cool stuff. Uh, but even in 1988, 98, 99, still way too early. So uh, VRML sort of went on to the evolutionary scrap heap, if you will. Though uh, if you pick any modeling tool, if you're a 3D modeler, they've all got VRML export and import. So it lives on in that realm. Uh, meantime, Folks at Adobe and other places were working as SVG, 2D tag set. So this idea of basically taking tags uh, to represent your content isn't, isn't a new one. And then we iterated on VRML and created something called X3D that had really good graphics in it. Uh, but all of this stuff still needed a plugin to actually render it. It was not built into the browser. So that itself also went down a little evolutionary cul-de-sac, uh, still lingering out there. Meantime, Microsoft created one called XAML, also XML tags for representing your 3D. And they did a really good job of integrating the 3D and the 2D, which is great. I mean, we can do that today in WebGL. I mean, all the elements of Canvas and all of your layers can all just work together. It's beautiful. It's composited. It's a great thing. Well, they had that figured out with XAML, but it was proprietary. It was Microsoft. Nobody wanted to touch it. And the 3D was shitty. It did little building block 3D as well. So not very useful. Well, now you know, downtime 20 years later. We now have the rendering power in a web browser to basically do half-life graphics. We have all kinds of technologies we can lean on in a web browser to do, you know, shadow DOM, web components, all the different scripting language alternatives we have. Why not pull these together into something that's a tag set that was like VRML was intended to be 20 years ago, uh, now running in an environment where there's no download, everybody knows how to code it, and there's all kinds of ways to get content into it. And so here we are. And so that's just a little bit of context. I don't generally like history slides, but I just wanted you to, guys to know I didn't invent this from whole cloth now. I mean, a lot of the tags you're going to see are kind of like what I've done before, and a lot of people have. These are not new notions. So uh, let's go take a look at the kind of shapes and materials we can build here. So what we can do is basically you know, put everything into a hierarchical scene where our objects are translated, we can make you know, spherical, simple, stupid stuff. We can do 3D generated text, all polygons. And that's just done with tags. Let's go look at some of the sample tags. We've seen the cube, got sphere, cone, cylinder, text object. And these are all tentative. I mean, I don't know which, which of these tags are going to survive, what the exact design of the language is going to look like. But boom, that's all it took. That was more or less the code other than a surrounding group and a couple of groups to nest. And we're going to look at that in a second um, to get this scene on the screen and rendered and live. So let's do a view source on that. Probably have to crank up the size of this window a little bit. Can you guys see that or is that too small? All right. Yeah. So, you know, to get started in here, I basically, in my jQuery ready, I have to call it glam ready to go in and parse all those other elements. But the elements are just sitting in my page otherwise, right? I've got a div that's a container. And just for now, for convenience, what I did is I look at all the child elements of the div that's the canvas that I pass into glam to get started. And that's the scene I parse. But the great news is the DOM parser actually just parses that for me. I didn't have to do anything. It's just sitting in the browser's DOM. It doesn't know what to do with these elements. These names are, you know, my names. I probably should put a GL prefix in front of all of them, you know, that kind of thing like you do in, uh, in Polymer. Um, but they're just sitting in there. And that is the entirety of the scene description for all those objects. And if you've built any 3GS code, I mean, and I use 3GS as the example because it's the most popular way to do this, you know it's quite a bit more involved to just do that three times, four times the page code, you know, page size, and a lot of JavaScript, and whoops, a lot of things to get wrong. Ken. So, um, looking at this makes me want to sit down and code right now. Um, That's but, what I wanted to hear. That's the reaction. I mean, but, but my wife could do this, and she's a Photoshop jock, but she's not a coder, right? How she could do this. Is, how much of this, you said some of these tags might not survive? 
Well, yeah, none of this is, this is all completely preliminary in terms of what the names of those tags are. Don't start building glam apps yet unless you're ready to change your code every five minutes because, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably going to like put GL prefix on the front of it. That sounds good, right? I mean, I just thought of that right now. It should probably be prefixed to just keep it a safe namespace because this is in the global document namespace. Or find some other tricks for that, right? Yeah. Are you defining the, the glam vocabulary on its own, like schema or something like that, so we can namespace uh, I suppose I should do an XML schema and all that XHTML stuff. Haven't gotten to it yet. If you're a jock at that, if you're good at that, please help me with that. It's just, there's too much to do. I wanted to focus on, let's look at the tags, let's see if it feels good, let's get something on the screen, make sure it all does what you want. And then there's all these technology things to figure out, in, including that one. I mean, there, there would be a formal declaration of this at some point if it ever becomes real. Remember, this is an R&D project, thought exercise. I want flowers to bloom from it. So if someone wants to schemaify it, God bless you. But yeah, so here's the next, we go to the next level on that. And you can see the other tags that I just showed you up on the view source. So basically, we can nest groups. This is a way to create a hierarchy of your 3D objects. Very common. I mean, it's exactly like a DOM hierarchy, but it's extended into 3D. And then the grouping can have uh, 3D transforms applied to them. Uh, 3D properties, XYZ, SXS, you know, for scale and all that. Um, so this is the actual structure of the scene content with the groups in it. And those, and those transforms, you know, propagate down just the way, at least if you're doing absolute positioning, stuff happens in a, you know, set of div tags. Yeah, well, let's go into interaction. This is great. This is where I feel really good about this stuff. So I rolled over it. I got a mouse over event. I rolled out. I got a mouse out. Down, up, click. How did that happen? Another 40 or 50 lines in 3JS to create a projector object, do 3D math on it, tell me what got hit. You need to do that for every object in your scene. And your bosses decided they don't want to invest in that web project anymore. It's taking too freaking long. So how do we do it? The glam way? Here's how we do it. Does that look familiar? Alan, just suspend your prejudice. Right. How do you do it? You add event listeners. I'm literally using DOM add event listener, and this stuff just works. Now under the covers, I'm doing a lot of glue. DOM observers, all this nonsense, right? Extra on, callbacks. But the point is, you could add one of these to each thing in your scene. So it's essentially like taking that DOM and going all the way into the canvas with it. Every and object is now clickable, rollover-able. And is the bubbling like, uh, uh, like where your camera is, or how does even bubbling and stuff? I have not thought through the bubbling model yet. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities for bubbling in, in this 3D thing. And so I, I've left it as a TBD. If you have opinions and want to talk offline about it later, that would be great. Uh, so for now, actually, under the covers, when I generate custom, you know, so I'm under the covers, I'm generating custom DOM events. And one of the properties you supply is whether that thing bubbles. And I turned bubbling off because it made my page go freaking wild. But that's probably just because I wasn't handling it out at the outer level in the right way. I mean, it literally made my canvas disappear and stuff. And I was like, OK, I've got to talk in two days. I'm going to deal with bubbling later. So, uh, yeah. Uh, are the tags only for shapes, or what about things like uh, filters or camera? We're going to get to some of that. So th there, I, I don't have examples of camera tag. I might have a camera tag in there somewhere just to get some of the demos going. The demos get sort of increasingly more complex as we go here. Uh, but there will be ca tag, you know, uh, tags for cameras, lights, and sort of the common things you're going to have in a 3D scene. But it goes beyond that. So let, let's keep going, and maybe some of those questions will get answered. And then there's animation. So, you know, 3D content's great, and a 3D rendering is wonderful, but if you can't actually animate the thing as well as interact with it, you might as well have a still render, right? I mean, a lot of this is about making the pixels move on the screen. Um, here's one place where web browsers are actually pretty far along. CSS has got all this animation technology, which you can use to make properties change over time. Um, the way I really wanted to make this work was to use these at sign web keyframe directives or at sign keyframe, you know, browser dependent tag hell. But if you're using SAS or less, you can generate all that out to create a set of keyframes that animate objects. Okay? Unfortunately, this open source jQuery plugin CSS parser I used actually barfed on the at sign keyframe directives because it couldn't handle nested brace parsing in its regular expression. I mean, the, the regular expressions in the jQuery plugin to parse this CSS stuff are like literally they go across the page like three times. Um, so I punted on that. What I did is I took exactly the same structure 
and just made more tags. They call animation tags and keyframe tags inside them. They put the keyframes together to move things around. Does everyone know what keyframe animation is? In yep. basic sense, right? Make this thing go from one place to another or <coughs> make some va you know, property change over time, one way from one value to another. Over time, in succession, uh, in, they don't have to be regular spaced intervals, you know, from zero to one on a normalized time scale for the duration of your animation. So I can say, you know, make this thing, make this bottle move, you know, for the first quarter of the animation this way and then tumble this way. I do that with keyframes, right? So here's a simple tag space way of doing it. Ultimately, when I got my parsing technology further along, um, what I would do is have this with the at keyframe directives because all the properties you want to animate will, you know, work that way once I, that at time parsing works, right? So let's look at an example of that. Where is he? Here we go. And that was it. So that does that. Just does a rotation about Y with, you know, three keyframes, zero, 50%, and 100% about the Y axis. Nothing to it. And so oh, it's still interactive, by the way. Did that single animation need keyframes? Uh, you could create a different kind of data structure that says rotate it around Y. Um, or you could do a tween, but tweens are more properly designed for one shot, you know, go from this place to that place in a single shot, right? And I'm thinking about actually putting, you know, CSS has got transitions, which are basically tweens, yes. right? So those are the one shot ones. So you use keyframes for continuous animation, generally. These are gray areas, the lines are a little blurry. And you use tweens for one shot, go from here to there, transition from one place to another. So I didn't get to that in, in this demo. Um, and what's that? Uh, easing and all that? Yeah, I got some of that in some of the other examples. Let's see. Scene with multiple animations going. So there's more keyframes. And we can see here this cube, where this thing shaped like a cereal box with the grid texture on it. That's using ease in, ease out. So under the covers, I use tween.js, which is a really nice open source library to do the tweening. And it's got about 20 easing functions in it, which is fabulous, right? Um, there's only about three or four in standard CSS. I'd like to explore doing a little bit more than that. Um, yeah, so this one's using an easing and just continually applying that easing function. It's my own keyframer utility, so this is actually keyframed up and down, but I stole the, uh, the tween.js easing functions because they're already written in. You know, they, if you look at them, if you look at the code, they're just doing, they take a number from zero to one and they do a bunch of quadratic math on it to make values grow more slowly at the front end and, you know, back end of it, and it's, it's a curve. It's a curve yeah. tool in Photoshop. Yeah, it's just like a Photoshop curve tool. It's an animation curve in math. It's fabulous, right? So. And to me, you know, besides the DOM capabilities, the other thing I'm wild about, and maybe I'm just smoking it, you know, I just, I have no idea. Maybe people aren't doing it this way anymore. The uh, Polymer folks don't seem to care about this. Yeah, they'll support your CSS, but they're not extending CSS. You can't add your own CSS keywords. Web Components doesn't have a proposition for doing that yet. The set of, of so you've got this, it's ironic, you've got this extensible set of technology in Web Components that's coming out. Oh, I can build anything. Well, guess what? I can't build, I can't style it. Why don't you let me add a fucking property to the CSS? I can't style the thing. So, so I'm going to give up on styling now. The new way of doing it with, with Web Components and Polymer will be to just do it all in attributes. So you get it all in attributes and it's out of the CSS and you've no longer got that separation of presentation and structure, right? Your presentation's all kind of embedded in your structural code. That the whole point of CSS was to not have that. So you, you need to stop. <laughs> It, stop. We'll talk about that again when we come back to CSS. Right. So anyway, that's my opinion. So put a texture map on the cube that way. We got radius, you know, to do sizing kind of stuff, uh, cylindrical attributes. Uh, but we get better. We get into shaders and other stuff with this in a minute. So all clear? Make sense? I mean, these are the style attributes you'd apply to the 3D objects in your DOM. But we can go beyond that. We can actually not just bring in stupid, I mean, create stupid little uh, uh, shapes like cubes and whatever. We can actually bring in rich content in other formats. So I created this tag called import. All it does is you give it a source tag and it will import a format that right now the engine knows about and there's a few of them, right? So there's several popular 3D modeling formats out there already. There's a kind of uh, OBJ kind of format, Wavefront OBJ, it's become a standard. It's a text-based format for representing a single mesh with all its materials and visual properties. But it's just a single object. Uh, similarly with STL, the 3D printing format that's become popular for representing a polygon mesh. But you can't represent an entire scene with it, and you can't represent a camera, and you can't represent lighting, and you can't represent advanced shading and all that. So there are these other formats out there 
that are quite a bit more advanced. One is called Collada. Has everyone heard of that? Exported by most of the modeling tools out there, though the export quality has been kind of crap over the last few years. It's, there was, WebGL has created a new environment where uh, the industry is starting to resuscitate some of these content tools for WebGL use. And so what we're seeing now is Collada's uh, support is getting improved again in the uh, digital content creation tools. And I'm actually working on another format. Nah, you can't really see it in here. After the Collada, it says GLTF. I got a little bit of a color problem here. So same group, Kronos Group, does Collada, does WebGL. We have a project now called GLTF. That's essentially trying to represent all the same data that's in Collada and more, because there's been newer graphics innovation since then, in a scene description format that's JSON. So, you know, imagine, see the structure of all these buildings, so the translations and all that, the placement of each building mesh in here happens in a JSON file, but all the vertex data for the complicated stuff is in a binary file. And that binary file's format is typed arrays. Everyone know what a typed array is? So typed array is a data type in a web browser introduced for WebGL coding. Uh, it's used for other things now, like you know, rich media and communication protocols and other things. But it was you know, driven by the need for getting rich data into the browser for WebGL. And what it is, is it's a, basically it's a packed data structure that's the same as the native code data structure, essentially. So if you've got a million vertices in your 3D mesh, what you don't want to happen is do those all as JavaScript numbers. I mean, this a crap pile of text. Even if you gzip the crap pile of text, the browser reads it and parses it, and it's got JavaScript numbers. Well, guess what? What's in a JavaScript number? A JavaScript number is a variable, just like any other JavaScript variable. And the VM doesn't know what the hell it is, so it keeps extra type information, so everything's bigger than it needs to be. It's not compact. It's not represented the way the machine would represent it. So a typed array has that. So all your vertex positional data, any indices, if you're using indexed ways of getting at your triangle faces, all your normals and all that colors, all that rich stuff is in these typed arrays, which GLTF supports. So that's fabulous. So that's the kind of stuff I don't think we should be reinventing in GLAM. Now, maybe we need to have uh, a simple text-based way of representing basic vertex data so you could generate shapes in JavaScript to make that easy. I haven't implemented that yet. Uh, that's what we used to do in X3D. That's what they do in Collada. You've got giant text files with lots of numbers representing your mesh data. Not a great thing for web and mobile delivery. So that's what GLT was, GLTF was invented for. So with this import tag, getting back to our main track here, we can bring in a file like this and still have a very simple web page to deal with it, but then we could add all the other stuff. We could add backgrounds to it. We could add interactive things floating around and do that in GLAM. Yeah. So I just created a simple, there's a cam, there is a camera node in there, now I remember. <laughs> okay, I was finishing up the demo the last two days. I was adding nodes furiously to this thing. So there's a camera object, so I'm just putting that on a position and rotation animation on a cycle here using the same tags we were looking at before. But this 3D model was created in 3D Studio Max. I got it off a site called TurboSquid. I, I paid 100 bucks for it, but that's because I was using it to write my latest book as well. Um, and then we converted it from FBX to 3D, or the, we went from 3D Max through Maya to out to Collada, and then uh, used a batch converter we have to go to GLTF, the compact binary format. So there it is. Or actually, in this case, this isn't even the GLTF version. I think it's the DA. Let me look. Yeah, take it back. So that's the DAE. Uh, so that's a, the DAE is Collada, by the way. So let's do a view source on this real quick to see how simple that looks. That's it. Now, of course, the 3D model is hefty. The 3D model is a few megabytes of, of city data, right, that some artist created. But to bring that in, oh, I got a little note called a background that does a background skybox with a six-face texture. So we're in just a way to do a cheap panoramic background with a cube texture. It's also a spherical pano background, so we have. Um, I might show you one of those. That's pretty cool. Oh, I'm going in a minute. And then there's the camera, and we've got a camera animation there, so you're asking about that. It's that simple. So you could, I mean, you could basically import these kind of models, add some simple animation, simple click interaction. Um, what I don't have yet, but I plan on doing, is when you import this, that file all, has all the uh, type ID or, and name information in it, um, so that the runtime in here could actually reach in and get at objects inside the scene as well. So you could create interactive behaviors for objects inside the scene. Haven't instrumented that yet, but it would basically, There'll be another API to give you like a, a shadow DOM within the shadow DOM to get inside the contents of that 3D scene. So why can't this be HTML import? Because shadow DOM pretty much does the exact same thing, right? It's just a, li a link relic was import and then get this guy. That way you don't have to deal with things like uh, loading this asynchronously or synchronously. You don't have to worry about blocking and stuff. Right, like but that, that file format's not natively read by the browser. 
So it's they, perfectly fine. So I mean, anyway, in this case, you you are the one who's parsing it. Right. So eventually, when it does become a standard, then it's probably going to be native. From your lips. So someday, if browsers actually implement this natively, you do some of these things and a little a little bit differently. That's right. Excellent insight, by the way. So, you know, I'm smart, I've been at this a long time, and my goal was to take those thousand things we do every day in 3D now, and give people an easy way to do those. But I can't think of everything, and most of us in this room are never going to think of everything that you could do. So it's really important to come up with ways to extend this. And I don't mean extending the tag set, that gets into another, I mean, maybe that becomes a, a web components and polymer issue. I'm not talking about custom tags. I'm, I'm literally talking about custom behaviors, custom rendering, custom shading, once you have a good base language and base tag set to work with. And so I thought it'd be really important to include first class support for shaders in here. So let's look at an example and then we'll look at the markup for it. And this one is lifted, ported if you will, from uh, one of the 3JS examples. It's fabulous. Sorry, I'm hitting the wrong link here. So this is uh, one of these skybox backgrounds. So I can move around the scene. And the bubbles are rendered with what's called a Fresnel shader. So that's using a vertex and fragment shader pair that does reflection and refraction rendering. And so it's a bit of a cheat because the reflection's faked. You pass to the Fresnel shader the cubic texture so it knows how to get the bits from the background. It's not literally rendering the contents of the scene live. You can do that in WebGL too, that's a little more complicated. You put another camera in, you render your scene from that point of view to an off-screen texture, you make it a texture map. Extremely complicated, can be slow, can be fast depending on the implementation. So this is a bit of a cheat, but the refraction is being used and the reflection are being used with that cube texture to basically warp what you're seeing through the bubble. And it's fabulous. And th so this came with the 3JS samples and I essentially just ported it to Glam. And so let's see what that looks like. Okay, so here are the six URLs to make your skybox background. And I'm putting that in a class because I'm going to use that in a couple of different objects. Here's some styling on the bubble. I'm saying it's a sphere of radius five. I'm giving it a color diffuse, whatever. And then I'm supplying the shader. And that's these lines I'm selecting right now. All right. So in WebGL, you always need a pair of shaders. You need a shader to generate the vertex positions, take them from 3D space and get them onto the screen. And you need one to paint the pixels based on those vertex positions and the inputs like the texture map and the color and everything in your material. Um, is anyone, are people familiar with this? This is shading, you know, and it's written in a language called GLSL, a C-like language that is compiled and sent to the hardware. So everything you're seeing here, when we look at the shader, is going to be um, executed on the GPU for every vertex and every pixel you're going to see on the screen. So let's look at the code, because that's pretty fun. So the vertex shader for this Fresnel um, declares these variables you pass in. Uniforms are variables that are passed in that are used for the entire mesh. Varying are variables that the vertex shader will pass out and hand on to the fragment shader so it knows what to do, how to get bits out of the texture based on light sources and other things that are pointing. So when you're doing WebGL programming, you end up doing a lot of this. If you're using 3JS, it has a material system under the covers. You mostly don't need to worry about it. You say, I want a Fong shader, and it gives you a realistically kind of lit thing for free, basically, because it's got a library of these. But everything you see rendered in a WebGL scene always has something like this under it somewhere, even if the library is hiding it. So this is our way of doing it in Glam. I'm re referencing an external shader file. This could also be a reference to an, uh, a custom script element with its inner HTML content. There's lots of techniques for doing this. I'm just using Ajax to fetch it right now, because it just seems like the most crisp way to represent uh, things in the shader in terms of the value of that property. And then down here, all those variables that were declared in the programmable shader have to somehow magically get fed to the hardware. And it is all being done under the, under the covers with this, t this code plus uh, 3JS doing its shading for me. And I just, I'm literally declaring the parameters, what their types are and their initial values are. So each, it's triples, it's a set of triples here. So there are 15 tokens in that selected line Every three of them is a parameter. So the refraction ratio is a floating point that's got a, a value of 1.02, and so on. And the texture cube thing, there's just a trick there, which is I'm just doing some magic to see if there's a texture cube type. That's what um, the T is. 
and it's called T-cube, I'm just saying, oh, I'm going to get this, the, I already know there's an environment map on this object. That's not the way you'd really do it. I just didn't have time to invent a syntax to reference which parameter it would actually be. But this is very similar if you guys have ever looked at CSS shaders, which has sort of gone up and down and maybe dying on the vine, but the programmable shaders for uh, actually pixel twizzling your divs, CSS shaders from Adobe. Um, similar syntax for just declaring how things get in and out of the shader. And their shaders are a lot more limited. This you can do anything. This is like the, you know, invitation to melt the screen, though uh, WebGL security model tries to m make sure that doesn't do anything too bad. And again, all glued together with the magic of CSS. And we'll get to how I animate the bubbles in a minute. Because there's some fun in there, too. Like I said, I'm a big fan of the DOM. So I thought it'd be important to be able to use the DOM to manipulate the tree programmatically. Because it's great to declare things in markup, but sometimes you need to change your scene contents. Well, how are you going to do that? They could have given people another API where they'd start, you know, dicking around in JavaScript to have to add and remo remove and all that. But why give them another one? We've actually got one here. We've got the DOM set attribute, get attribute. We've got add and remove children, right? So we're going to use this. And so what do we do here? Oh, this create bubble, that's in a loop. I created 20 of those. They're all floating around. They've got a couple different random variables about positioning or whatever. So I just call this 20 times in an outer loop. This is the one that creates one of them. So there's my 20 DOM elements. They're in there. They're the appended. Under the covers, I got a mutation observer figuring out what's happening and reacting to those changes and calling some horrific chain of JavaScript functions to get it to all work right, but it works. So. What can we do with that? I made this just a littlest bit more fun. Where are my bubbles? There we go. So now this combines all of it. I've programmatically created the scene. I've added event listeners to each bubble. Got a little audio in there just for the hell of it. Just a simple, you know, wave file. I could do this all day long. I might. How much time we got? It's, it's meditative. It's so contemplative. Uh, I don't have a counter. I was going to have a life meter. I was going to make this into a game. I was like, okay, these guys are going to get it. I don't need to do that. But yeah, I was going to respawn when you got when you got rid of enough. I was going to respawn and just you know, time. You know, it's, it's all up on GitHub. You can make a game out of this, guys. Yeah. What's that? Or yeah, and that's a great question. All right, so under the covers, there's a lot going on here. Let me just reload it so we got more bubbles to look at. So I get to pop a few more. And this is taking a while. I think it's the Fresnel shader creation. I don't know. It's, it takes a while even without all the glam stuff on top. Okay, so the way this works in 3D, I mean, so have you guys done canvas drawing and your own hit detection in canvas where you do math? I mean, basically taking the mouse position and figuring out where it lives inside the bounding boxes of your things in your 2D canvas. So you take that same idea into 3D. Now in 3D, You've got this conceptual model of a world that's sort of in a box. It's actually a truncated pyramid, you know, starting out at the front plane of the screen, going back into the, what we call the back plane, where you don't render anymore. And along the way, you've got, it's a perspective. This is a perspective camera, not orthographic. So we're literally, let's say, this is a, you know, 60 degree perspective view on the scene. So we've got something with a 60 degree angle truncated pyramid. That volume is where all your 3D content lives. It all gets projected onto the screen, right? The process of projecting that onto the screen it all happens in the shaders and all this other stuff, right? You have to do the inverse of that process to do your hit detection in 3D. So what you do is this mouse position gets converted into a ray that starts at the front clipping plane and goes straight back through the world. And then you mathematically, using math, you see if that ray intersects the objects in its path, right? And there are lots of ways to make that fast. The 3JS library is doing this picking for me. I, I got a lot of framework stuff under the covers that makes it less work for me. But essentially, at the end of the day, it's the 3JS framework. And you say, OK, here's the whole scene. Tell me what's picked. 3JS's version of that is I'm going to go through the whole list of everything. It didn't sort it or anything like that. Every frame, I'm going to go through the whole list of everything, tell you what's picked. Now, it's doing a few optimizations, like if the thing's bounding sphere isn't anywhere near it, it doesn't try and pick against all the triangles, right, or the bounding box. So it's got some trivial reject is what we call it. But if you're in the bounding volume and that ray intersects it, then you go in and say, okay, did it actually hit any geometry? So if you have a complex curved shape, you might miss it. And you didn't want the hit detect to say you clicked on it, right? 
I mean, you might as an app developer, in which case what you do is you put a transparent sphere box around it and make the hit detection fast. But if you want to actually see if the thing was clicked, 3GS will go and find the triangle it was hit on and tell you that triangle, where it is, what position it is in space, and, you know, normal shooting off it and other interesting stuff, which can be a very expensive operation. Long-winded way to answer your question, but, yeah, you're doing some fun math to get there. What else did I want to say about this? And we talked about all that. I added the event listeners for a click, which we already covered. Where do we go from here? Yeah, so now I've talked about this a little bit. Let's get into how we implemented it somewhat. So uh, I love 3.js. It is the most popular JavaScript library for doing WebGL coding. I find it lacks a lot of things to do app development that I like in 3D. Um, who's, who here has built a game in Unity? Anybody know Unity? So Unity is designed to follow modern game engine design practices. It really sort of well understood principles of how you design your objects. And it's a really good embodiment of that. So it uses an entity and component model for plugging your functionality together. So I built one of those in JavaScript. I dubbed it Visi for visualization. And it's basically a framework that sits on top of 3JS. I didn't reinvent 3JS's rendering materials. I didn't want to re-implement the picking math because I hate math. I'm just like Glenn Barbie. Um, so all that's being done for me. But on top of that is a component layer, which makes it easy to plug and play functionality. So you know, if you've got some component you want to add a script to go through and you know, count its mesh data or you know, count the triangles in the mesh, just add a component, it'll do it. And the, that component knows what to go talk to to figure out where the mesh is. And it's all sort of automagic. And so the reason I was able to basically, I've been working on Glam on and off for over a year. Um, then I signed up to give this talk because Anne said, do something controversial. You don't need to teach people about WebGL anymore. They get it. So I was like, well, this is controversial. Everybody I talked to over in WebGL land, especially if they're in a browser or company, they're like, oh, we gave you a canvas. Go just draw. Fuck you. I don't, you don't need markup. You get a, you know, I don't want to go into the standards committees for the markup. I don't want, you know, I was sitting out there with these guys in Microsoft figuring out whether to put the cube here or the cube here and the group there and the X there. I don't want to do that. We gave you a canvas. Fuck off, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I've been at it on and off for a while, but I signed up to do this talk, and then, I don't know, a month ago, I was like, holy crap, I better actually implement Glam. And the reason I was able to do this work in about a month that you saw was because it's sitting on Visi. And I just, you know, I, what I had to do is figure out the mutation observers, crawling through the DOM API, some of the CSS parsing, and, you know, a few design issues. Once I sort of built some examples, I was like, ah, I don't like the way that looks. Iterated a few times. But the reason it went so fast is I had Visi to do the framework stuff, so very, you know, 10 lines of code to do something it would take 30 or 40 in 3GS, and 3GS to do all the rendering for me, no fancy WebGL stuff for me, because Ricardo's done a bunch of that already in his library. And then TweenJS is great, like I was saying, for the tweening math and the one-shot effect. So that's the client-side stack. And then all the help you get from the uh, browser, DOM mutation observers and all that other stuff that, you know, so you can detect when somebody sets an attribute or somebody adds or removes a child, messes with the class list, and then you can go just change everything. I see you. So at the end of the day, you are drawing to a canvas, right? What's that? At the end of the day, you are drawing on a canvas. At the end of the day, 3JS is drawing to that canvas for me. Got it. And that's all it is. It's a canvas element on which you've created a WebGL rendering context by the magic of that. When I showed the 3JS version of the cube, you say create a WebGL renderer under the covers that says context dot, I mean canvas dot get context quote WebGL. You get back a context that gives you all the GL API methods in JavaScript. Yeah, under the covers, it's all drawing. The browser isn't doing it for us. We're do, you know, it's all this stack, right? Like I said, the browser doesn't throw, th thankfully, it throws out the CSS, but it doesn't throw out my DOM tree, so I just got it there. So I just crawl through it, figure out what my scene looks like, put on the observers. It tells me when things change. Uh, it doesn't do the CSS for me. I know, be that as it may, some people may think that's not an issue, but I would like to be able to style every element in there. And I've mentioned this already. What about web components? I started the project a little bit in advance of when Web Components was coming out. So I just got to the point where I just made a very practical decision prior to coming out and doing this big unveiling of, of this, as this is the first public appearance of GLAM, um, that I didn't want to go down a rat hole on Polymer. I mean, there's a bit of work there. You've got to use a build system. There's stuff, right? And there's a whole mindset to get into. And after that was all done, I still wasn't going to have my CSS, and I want my CSS. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm a dinosaur. Um, and I really do feel like you, you want to be able to separate your presentation and your structure. So, sorry, I'm a fan. Sorry, Famous. I like the DOM. I like CSS. Sorry, Eric Beidelman. I like CSS. You know, so there it is. 
but I do want to see if I can get this going in Web Components and Polymer. Um, want to do more features. There's a lot of things I didn't get a chance to implement. Um, and I am having discussions with people making browsers from two different companies making browsers right now. Um, one of them found me and said, hey, what do you think of this idea? And I said, well, I've actually been working on it already. And then someone else found out I was doing this, and they said, we need to talk about this. So that's good. So, you know, despite this sort of camp, the imperative camp, the people who say just code all day in JavaScript to make your graphics, and they do, you know, exist in the bigger companies, um, there's a new camp forming, which says, maybe those tags could someday be standardized. Maybe the browser will just know what to do with them. And, you know, still give you the extensibility hook so you're not stuck because they only gave you cubes, right? They give you all the hooks you need to actually do custom rendering and custom components. Um, so we're going to see how that goes. That's very early in that process. Like a year from now, if uh, things aren't happening in that area, I'd be disappointed because I'm pretty excited. I think there's a, a lot of potential there. Um, and I think a lot of people are interested in this. And it sounds like some folks in the room are too, which is great. Um, so if you are, please get involved. I've got uh, you know, all the URLs and everything. Uh, right here, and uh, you know how to find me from the other info on the slides. So yeah, don't be a drag. Let's go build 3D markup for the web. It's time. 20 years after I tried to do this, I think it's really time. It's going to work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That, that was always going to be my five-word uh, five Webby Award acceptance speech, by the way, and this time it works. <laughs> so thanks. Uh, Open season, let's go. What, uh, Alan, now, what, what's wrong with CSS? Oh, well, you know, it's, it's, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, it, it's not object-oriented. You don't override things in a sane way. That's why these tools have evolved to try and manage it for you. But it's basically a mess. Yes, and, um, yes. You need an interface to it that presents something more sensible to the programmer. Can't someone do that? It's being done in ClojureScript, so I can tell you that much. Okay. <laughs> where uh oh. Where no, okay. No language geek fights in this room, please. <laughs> um, Dom geek fights, okay. No language geek but, uh, fights. I mean, look, the Dom is not going away. It's there. There's you know, obviously uh, people have found ways of dealing with it in more performant fashion with React, for example. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep, going. keep going. Um so uh and explicitly uh uh the approach that I've seen lately is not to distinguish between CSS CSS attributes and inherent attributes. Um I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Really I do understand your concerns about structure versus presentation. But that's not always a clear line, is it? No, it's it not. It should be. It should be, but it's not always. And, and, you know, web developers routinely violate it. And, you know, there's DOM element constructs for uh, layout. And there are CSS constructs for, you know, positioning. And, I mean, sure. they, they, they go again, you know. So, so um, agreed. Just by going to this URL, will I find everything I need to replicate your examples? Well, yeah, that's, that's the repo. It's Great. just GitHub repo. There's no GitHub pages yet. I didn't have time to put a fancy skin on it. but. Fine. You know, and, and this is the manifesto, and that's going to go up. It's on SlideShare. I'll put the URL out there for people, and the show will have the well, slides. You know, I am interested in seeing whether I can put a clean functional interface to this whole thing. Fabulous. Go for it. That would be f wonderful. I encourage you to do that. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, in the future, if this does become a standard, or even before that, how do you see uh, 3D tags interact with, uh, with 2D tags? Say, for example, I have like a panel inside which I need HTML. Have you Inside the 3D? Inside the 3D, I want like regular web pages here, yeah. or an iframe for that matter. Yeah, this is tough. I mean, this is one of the reasons there's this CSS 3D transform stuff in the browser already. So if you want to do an interface that flips flat objects around on your page, you can use CSS transform so that, and your div elements will move so nicely. Like but that CSS doesn't CSS. exist in the world yet. There's no way in WebGL, no good high performance, high visual quality way yet to render your page, you know, divs and your other page content on the surface of an object. There's people working on that. I've got some prototypes of that, too. There's some, like, there's an SVG hack that renders to Canvas, but the problem is it's using SVG's object support. It's a hack. It will draw to a 2D Canvas. The moment you try and put that 2D Canvas on a WebGL surface of an object, it hurls with a security violation. Because the WebGL guys are paranoid about security, so there's no way to render that page. But even, imagine that in the future the browsers do support it. 
how do you say, won't there be like a conflict between how 3D events are handled and how 2D events are handled? And is Probably. Going to I think there's going to be stuff that needs to get worked out to make the event handling work consistently. And, you know, there's a really legitimate question about what am I doing? Am I just viewing that or can I interact with that element? Am I interacting with a 2D element that's skewed? Am I clicking on it with the mouse? Am I typing in forms? Would I want to do that? Right. Is this, right. Is this rotated surface have real DOM elements? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is it a real DOM element or is it just using a DOM to get some like pretty display, you know, in a quick hack? That would be nice. I'd love to have that if I just had a styled page. You know, that I could do some presentation content with on the surface of a WebGL object as a texture. That'd be fine. I'm not sure if I need to do input on that cylinder or the, the surface of the car or someone's face that's got a <laughs> web page mapped on it. I'm not sure that matters. Hey, I'm kind of new to this whole space, but I think it's amazing. Um, quick question, just a little easy one. Like on your example of the cube, would it support multiple textures on the? That particular way I constructed that cube wouldn't. But it wouldn't be too hard to do that. I mean, I'm just using a 3GS cube primitive, which puts one cube on uh, one texture around the whole surface. But that cube is a great it's a great thought example because classic thing for that would be make that make the six sides of that have Flickr photos on it, right? It's my home photo cube or something, and maybe it's a dynamic Flickr feed. It may be a great way to do that kind of little thing. Um, so in order to do that, what you do is you create six flat polygons. I yeah, I mean, right now. But I thought about actually making it so you could do six textures on a cube because it just seems like such a common use well, case. Isn't your background skybox an example of just that? It is just that. Yeah. It's, it's six textures on the face of a cube. Yes. Oh. Maybe even 3 gss cubes actually just do this now for me. I, can, I can't remember if I implemented that with six separate faces or a cube. I'll have to go look at the underlying code. And I can't see examples of 3 Yeah. Cubes. I just don't know if it's on six separate faces. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's exactly what that skybox is. Um, yeah, so I think we were buttoned up against the next talk, so I don't want to uh, hog the room. You could have piped a video through this surface. And those videos, uh, you can put a video element on any, you can put a video element or a 2D canvas uh -huh. on any WebGL texture. Oh, okay. So I have another demo I use for my book where you're driving a car around a virtual scene, yeah. and the speedometer dials on the car are moving, and that's actually being drawn with canvas, reacting to the speed of the car as you're moving around. Oh, okay. But it's just a texture map on the car. Okay. It's beautiful. So. Um, if anybody, does anyone want a copy of the book? So I brought freebies, but they're upstairs. You don't have one yet? Shame. <laughs>